And we are live. So let me share this really quick. If you are just joining us, I'm Bow Wow Bill, and I have with me my good friend, Ted Epthiomitis. And uh, give us a second here. Let me share this on a couple pages. I'm going to be sharing this on my personal page and then a, a dog page. So how you doing, buddy? In the meantime, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and and uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, doing great. Glad to be here chatting with Bill. Um, yeah, so I work with aggressive dogs. That's my thing. Some would call me a dog trainer. Um, I guess that's probably the most fitting label, but I'm a dog trainer that specializes in rehabilitating reactive and aggressive dogs. Um, and uh, I've been doing that for the last nine years. So, uh, yeah, I love it. it uh, every day is a new day, which is the which is the really interesting thing. It never gets old. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of a specialty that people seek out. And um, it's also something that uh, some some dog trainers they they kind of uh, bite off a little bit more than they can chew uh, with the cases that they take on involving aggression. Um, would you agree? Yeah, I think uh, people will do that sometimes with the best of intentions. Um, you know, typically people get into dog training because they want to help dogs, they want to help people, uh, and they have great intentions when they're getting started. Uh, but you know, there's there's definitely some trainers out there that are that are have um, taken on a little bit you know, what I would classify as dogs that are over their pay grade. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's very dangerous for everybody involved, unfortunately. But, you know, on the other side of the coin, I always say like, you have to learn it somewhere and there's not a whole lot of schools that are going to teach you. So um, it's not a bad way to learn. You just want to make sure that you have a really seasoned uh, mentor available. Uh, I know the first you know, probably at least three or four years, I had a mentor that I was checking in with all the time. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, there's so much to learn, but you, you want to have somebody that knows much more than you so that they can kind of guide you along the way and make sure you're not doing something really dangerous or, or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, and, and you can get in trouble really quick with these dogs. And I wanted to mention your your DVD. <laughs> Do you still have this available? I know that this was a little while ago. I got this. He's not friendly, and um, I mean this is excellent. I definitely recommend this uh, for for professionals. Uh, and and if you are not a professional and you're dealing with an aggression uh, case, I definitely uh, recommend you working with a professional. Yeah. But, you know what's a what's that DVD series all about, man? Um, it's it, basically the first of its kind. I produced it two and a half years ago and, uh, I brought in four dogs onto my property and we basically went from start to finish, uh, with each of these dogs. Uh, they all had some different issues, uh, as far as where their aggression was stemming from, but basically it shows you kind of day by day what we're doing with all the dogs. It's about five hours long and, um, yeah, it's pretty, it, it turned out it turned out really well. I've got a lot of great feedback on it. If you are interested in purchasing it at any point, uh, you can either check out my website, mangodogsmedia.com, or you can buy the physical DVD at ecaller.com. Uh, they have them in stock there, so that's also an option. And uh, thanks for joining us, Eric. I, I noticed that Eric was had joined in and uh, mentioned that it's a great DVD, so thank you for the... Uh, the good feedback. Yeah. yeah, Eric, welcome, man. Great to have you. And so, yeah, and you actually work through these cases with this. Uh, you know, you could see the dogs right when they're green getting to you, and then uh, you know, see see what's involved with that. And I often tell people that we belong to a society that is, you know, kind of instant gratification, push button. We have these little boxes in our pocket that allows us uh, so, mu so much uh, access to information um, that it, 
pretty remarkable, but it also changes the conception of, of outcome, uh, the, the timing of outcome, I think. Uh, it kind of, we want it right away, where when we work with behavior, especially behavior that has been uh, taught to the dog by, by the dog itself and gotten some outcomes that uh, were beneficial to that animal, it's not going to be an instant thing, is it? it? Takes time. It's you know the way I, I like to com- kind of communicate this is my personal opinion is that dogs are able to make much faster changes than people are. Uh, I kind of joke about it and I say, you know, I've got friends in high school or friends from high school that are still dealing with breakups from when they were 18 years old. Um, and you know, that's just kind of, you know, uh, we've all got our own kettle of fish to fry as they say, nobody's perfect. Um, but you know, dogs can change very rapidly, but unfortunately it is not a, an overnight change. It is not a snap your fingers and it's done change. Um, you know, uh, somebody who's really good at what they do, uh, can typically produce, uh, really significant changes between a month to two months. However, there has to be maintenance the client has to continue to um, be working with the dog and keeping these things up, similar to a diet, exercise regime, that kind of thing, if you want to continue to see the results. But yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah. and I, you know, you it's interesting to see. I think I think. I don't know why. Uh, interesting to see that people do live, you know, sometimes in the past, and they really you know, focus their whole life on on what has happened to them. And uh, we can learn a lot from our, our dogs that uh, adjust very well to the particular environment that they're existing in at that moment. And uh, you know, but it's also if if we are somebody that lives in the past and we get a dog that's high maintenance. And a lot of times that dog will take over <laughs> that, that situation because there, there doesn't seem to be a present leader, a uh, confident leader, leader there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think that people don't take the due diligence that's needed, especially when they're selecting higher maintenance breeds um, like, uh, like a game breed or, or a protection dog or a dog working, considered a working dog. And um, they don't know the work that goes behind it. They don't know the upkeep that it takes to maintain it. And a lot of times they find themselves in situations that we as professionals, I think, see all too often. And... Um, I wanted to speak about that today. It's it's regarding kids with dogs, and uh, they can be a wonderful thing. Wouldn't you agree? Hundred percent. I'm a dad. I have a daughter who's uh, just over two years old, and you know she's my everything. She's the cutest kid in the world, and means the world to me. Um, and when you have a kid, if you have dogs, and then you have a kid, like when you just have dogs, you think that, man, like these are my best friends. They mean everything to me. And then you have a kid and you go, oh, there's a different element to life that I didn't understand. And uh, um, it's incredibly profound. And so, uh, you know, I'm uh, not only am I somebody that specializes specifically in working with uh, child aggressive dogs, uh, but I'm also a father, and that gives me some unique perspective. So um, I'm very interested in this topic for for both of those reasons. Yeah, and um, what do you what do you see as as the biggest problem that people do when you you see a conflict between a child and a dog? Well, I think you alluded to it previously, and and this is obviously a more uh, long-term view of things. But if you think long-term about the dog that you're bringing into your home, if you're 20, 21, 25, 30 years old, and you're thinking, you know, maybe at some point I might want to have kids, 
you really want to be selecting for the type of dog that is going to make it much easier for you to bring a dog home. You know, contrary to popular belief, not every dog is created equal in how good that dog is going to be at dealing with conflict, uh, whether that dog is going to guard or not guard all of these different things. So I, I really like the, the brief point that you brought up about, you know, the genetics of the dog. What type of a breed is this dog? Is this dog known for being good with kids? And, you know, one of the things I find so fascinating is, is that, you know, I've been doing this for many, many years. I've talked to thousands upon thousands of people in person and on the phone about their dogs. And I have never once in my entire career had somebody call me and say, you know what? We think that we're going to have kids at some point. What type of dog should I get? I've never once had somebody ask me that, right? Yeah, and, maybe. you know, my email is all over the internet. My phone number is everywhere. You can call me anytime you want. I will talk to you for hours and I will not even charge you. I'm just that kind of person. And I've never once had somebody do that to me. And it, 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 it it's, it's kind of astounding, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a pretty big decision. I tell people when they're choosing a dog that uh, it's a decade decision at least. And, sure. uh, you know, it's it's not just now. We have to look into the future and take considerations about the life that we want. Um, it, it, you know, and, and it just sucks that when you do have a dog and then a baby comes in and, and there's a problem that happens, a lot of times there's a tough decision that needs to be made. And I tell people that, uh, you know, whenever we have a decision between a dog and a kid, we have to be really thankful for easy decisions in life because they're not, <laughs> really, uh, they don't really come to us that frequently. Right. You know, and even me as somebody who has traded my life to help people better communicate with these right. animals, I make no mistake, you know, there is no uh, more important um, figure in that relationship. In, in my opinion, uh, that, that kid um, is, is number one. Do you, do you agree? A hundred percent. Yesterday alone, I had three people call me who uh, either were uh, two were pregnant women who had just found out that they were pregnant and they both had dogs that were not good with kids. And so they were very concerned. They just found out and they were trying to be proactive, wanting to do something about it. Uh, and one was uh, a dog that lived in a home with two kids and, um, um, and you know, had, had, had a lot of different issues and, and, and stuff, but a lot of that centered around kids and, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, three phone calls in one day center, centered around dogs and kids. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, you know, I should I should videotape or audio record some of those phone conversations because, it, you know, I'm sure the way that your conversations go and the way that my conversations go is almost exactly the same um, as far as you love your dog more than anything in the world. But as that baby comes into this world, it will not even be a question. You will not be asking yourself, should this dog be in my home? Yes or no. It will be, how can I get this dog a new home as soon as I possibly can? Because I cannot put my child uh, in, in harm's way. And, um, uh, you know, I've made my career off of working with these dogs. But still, to a degree, I'm thinking, Okay, so you're bringing this baby home, and now you got to be doing the training and watching to make sure that this is going to be done absolutely flawlessly. This is an insane amount of work. It's going to cost you an insane amount of money. It's going to completely change your life. Do you really want that? And so I always give people options when they call me, and I say, listen, let's look at your options. Is this dog rehomable, right? Is he good with adults? Can we find him a home with a bunch of adults in the home? Uh, does the dog have to be euthanized? You know, one of the dogs yesterday, he will have to be euthanized. He's terrible with kids. 
He's bitten people. He's bitten kids. He's bitten dogs. He cannot be rehomed, right? And bringing a new baby into that is incredibly dangerous. And um, so, um, so those are usually the op- options: either rehome, um, or euthanize, or do the training. And uh, I, I like to give people those options, uh, and you know, as many as I possibly can. And one thing that I found very important, and I'm sure that you're the same way because I know you as a friend, um, it is never my place or your place to judge the decision that people make. Absolutely. All that we're doing is providing information from our standpoint and hoping that they make the best decision for them in a non-judgmental way. Absolutely. You know, I and one of the hardest things that I have to recommend is euthanasia. And it's after we've gone through every single route here and it's like look at this is going to be a huge issue this is a management issue this dog is unpredictable uh this dog is powerful you have kids in the house the dog has targeted kids and um you know we have to look at just just look at the raw statistics i mean uh and we were looking at this as before we went live here that children are the most likely to get bitten by a dog you know, 63 of attacks happen to children, okay? And and not only do they happen to children, that 77% of those happen uh, is a bite to the neck and the face, right? And and that's where, as a professional, I get it because that's where a dog is going to correct another dog. Is they're going to come up and nail them and say, hey, knock it off. I don't, I don't appreciate that. And... Um, uh, so these are traumatic, and uh, hi Kim, and and people, if you uh, if you have any questions uh, for Ted or I, you know, feel free to to uh, ask them in the comment section. We'll, we'd be happy to address them. Uh, if you if you have a situation uh, sure. that you're dealing with, please let us know, and and uh, we can also get you pointed to uh, you know some vetted help in your area uh, if if you need it. Um, so and. Dog attacks are the fifth most frequent qu- cause of emergency visits for children. And so we cannot, you know, we're, we're not here to judge. We're here to provide this information and provide the observations that we see as professionals day in and day out. And we love dogs. I do. I, I mean, I know you do, too. I see you with your dogs, but it's uh, I love people, too. And we are here to affect change for the better and uh, doing what's right doesn't always feel good. And when, when we're in a situation like this, it hurts my heart. And I'll remember every single dog that I've recommended this for, but you're right, man. I've, I have had cases that, uh, you know, that they didn't re- listen to my recommendations and it's happened again and it breaks my heart, but I'm not there to judge. And, I love it when it doesn't happen again, and I hope it never happens again. I hope it's just a fluke. But knowing what I know about animal, about these dogs, it's um, my obligation as a professional to tell you the truth, uh, no matter how how bad it hurts. So one of the things that I oftentimes use is, um, and by the way, welcome Cher, welcome Rich, and welcome Brenda. Um, thanks for joining us here, guys. If you do have any questions, feel free to post them there. But one of the things I oftentimes do, and feel free to snag this, any of the trainers who are watching, I have very candid conversations with people. Of course, once again, I'm not judging these people. And I literally tell them, here are your options. And if you were my sister, here is what I would tell you to do. I always take their perspective of, because I do have a sister, if you were my sister, what would I tell you to do? Would I tell you to invest all of your life savings into training this dog? Would I tell you to invest the um, coordinating shirts? I like it. Um, thanks, Desiree. Um, would I tell you to completely change your life and your lifestyle for the next 10 years of your life so that you can make sure that this dog continues to live in your house? A lot of times the answer is no, right? Um, 
you know, sometimes if it's a case where I think things can be cleaned up a little bit quicker, that's one thing. But I always try to take this perspective of, are you my brother? Are you my sister? Are you my mom and my dad? Who are you? What would I tell you guys to do, the people that I truly love, and I know how much it's going to impact their life? And I find that to be, uh, you know, the most beneficial thing that I can do for people because it's not a cold and sterile answer. Here, here are your options. Go for it and whatever. It's here's what I would do. Like, and I know as much as anybody does out there about what this is actually going to turn out to look like. Yeah. Well, and you know if they're capable of it, and you need to ask them to be honest with themselves a lot of times too, because I've had, you know, I've I've laid out the plan, and the people are are gung ho steady, and I'm like, let's now let's talk about real realistic expectations, and <laughs> and there was no way, man. Um, I'll tell you and, what, Bill. When I had my my daughter Athena things started to change, but I'll tell you when things completely changed in how I relate to people with dogs and kids that have a potential issue when they're living together. I'll tell you, my daughter was about six months old and I was still feeling the same way about things. This is really important and now I'm a dad and everything like that, but everything changed one day when I forgot to close a baby gate and there was there's about seven stairs that go down to my front door and my daughter she wasn't I don't think she was even crawling or anything at this point but she was near it and I was just rushing and I was busy and I remember I left that baby gate open and she was close to it and I remember almost crying because there was so much power behind me going I almost allowed my daughter to fall down seven stairs and I am a proactive person and I am watching everything that I'm doing. I went in my car and I sat down and I, and I, and I started thinking about it and I said, you know what, if this was a home where somebody had a dog and a kid and they left that baby gate open, that kid would have got mauled. Yeah. And it was, I am, I am so consistent. I am so proactive. I am so focused on safety and I screwed up, which means no offense to anybody else that out there, but we're, you know, we all screw up. There is not many people that are more consistent than me. It took me six months to screw up that one time and forget something. But if my dogs were super aggressive and they were working through stuff and they were on one side of the baby gate and my daughter was on the other and I wasn't watching, that could have been a bad scenario. Luckily, I was able to close the baby gate. Nothing happened. I don't think she was even crawling at this point. But it just reminded me that even when you think you were 100% consistent, you will not be. And that was the moment that changed everything for me where I started getting so intense with people that would call me with these situations. And we can talk about that if you want, but um, that changed my life forever. Well, Cher says, um, um, I think I what I find most frustrating is trainers with baby have to justify why the dog would be I understand that there's always a reason, but the fact is there's a lot of dogs that wouldn't have bitten a child under the same circumstances until you have a child, it's hard to truly understand how a parent te- how a parent thinks when when these things happen. Yeah, I mean it's such a protective primal drive. You know, you see yourself reflected back. I don't have any kids, and so I have to like <laughs> you know postulate. But I couldn't even imagine looking at a little creature and seeing myself reflected back. You know, and knowing that that that's half me and. And, uh, you yeah, know, a little and, girl with a nice beard. Yeah, she would look good, man. And this is you, dude. You are you are conquering the space time continuum now, man, by <laughs> projecting your, you know, your a, a, a part of you into the future here. So that's pretty cool, I think. Um, but yeah, man, we don't know. And that's where people, you know, when people, um, 
I just had a, a client that, uh, you know, we're working with some long line stuff with their dog because their dog was starting to have some bad habits with reactivity with another dog on the walk. And I wanted to take it back to uh, to the foundation of some long line stuff to remind this dog to pay attention to this person. And uh, I told her, you know, no walks, just do the long line. And she she messaged me that that they went on a walk and the dog went after a dog, another dog. And I'm just like, cool, you know, no walks, long line from here on out. You know, yeah. and she's like, my bad. <laughs> but I get it, dude. I don't sure. I mean, these families are busy. How many how many uh, sports their kids are in? And as the kids get older, I mean, there's just so many moving parts in a lot of these family units that we really have to be realistic and um and that's it you know i don't have kids so i have to just kind of imagine and dude i love my space i love my time <laughs> you know and i love that i could put my dogs in a kennel <laughs> and they go out to dinner with my wife or something you know but the the thing is with the kids is that it's 24 7 right and it must be exhausting dude right i'm very lucky i have a uh <laughs> Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Yes. Yes. And you're welcome anytime, yeah. Nelson. I'm saying Thank you. <laughs> um, is it exhausting? I'm actually very lucky. One, I have a super supportive wife who is like mother of the decade. Um, and uh, two, my kid actually sleeps very well. Um, and so I have not had to kind of deal with the wrath of a child that doesn't sleep and, and so on. But I definitely understand and agree with, you know, it's just, it's just, it's a lot, you know, it takes over your life. It becomes uh, something that's very important. And um, yeah, it, it's just a lot, right. And people are busy and I do understand, but, but I always want to give people that option to be able to say, listen, if you literally will put in this time, if you literally would do this stuff, I'm, I tell people straight up on the phone, I'm just completely honest with them. If you want to remortgage your house so you can train your dog properly, I'm your guy because that's what it's going to cost you. And, you know, some people are like, OK, like I'm thinking about it. And I go, OK, and your next dog, the next thing you got to do is you got to come over to my shop, leave the dog at home. And I'm going to get you to run around in circles around my shop. And it's minus 20 degrees weather out. And I'm going to get you to do that. You got to do that for four hours. And. You, you know, you can't complain about it. And they're like, what, what, what does that have to do with, it, with anything? And I go, if you will not do what I tell you to do, your kid is going to get bitten. So if you do not do what I tell you to do, again, your kid is going to get bitten. And I am just so honest with people. Listen, I have a zero percent. So I have a hundred percent success rate with uh, clients that I've taken on who have dogs and kids with those types of issues. Thank God. And trust me, it is not because of my level of expertise it is only because there was a dear God up in heaven looking down on me, uh, making me, you know, it, as fortunate as I am, but, um, I've never had a kid bit and I've never had that happen. But I personally believe that one of the major reasons why that is, is just because I am so, so incredibly hardcore with people when they call me and, and I have to be because you cannot, it is not the same thing to take on a client who has a dog who's jumping up on people at the door. That is a 100% different client than what we're talking about. Because if that person does not follow through and that dog jumps up on somebody, nobody dies. Nobody gets seriously hurt. It's not the end of the world. But if you become my client and you don't do what I tell you to do and your kid gets mauled, that is a really big deal. And you will never be able to forgive yourself because of that. So uh, I, I just got to be really hardcore with people. It's the only way I found. Uh, I usually tell people for every hundred people that call me with this specific situation, I might take uh, two to four of them on as a client. So it's actually very rare that I will that I will be convinced that people are actually going to put in the time and do the work. So um, it's 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 pretty hard to get in for for my services for that stuff, just because the kid's priority, the kid has to be the priority. Well, and it's going to cost a premium too because it's going to take a lot of your focus 
and a lot of your energy as well to to get this you know figured out and and uh, in a situation that's going to mean real results for the long term. Yep. It's always long term, right? I end up working with these dogs for a minimum of six months to a year, um, every single time, sometimes longer than that. Sometimes it's two, three, four years. And I'm sorry, I just cannot put that amount of time into a dog and charge somebody $250. It's just not going to happen. So it's super long term. Um, it's super intricate. You have zero margin of error. Um, it, it's it's really tricky and unfortunately most people don't understand what they're getting into when they've got these issues and they call up the dog trainer and they say hey i've got some issues most people don't have realistic realistic expectations of how long it's going to take and what the cost is going to be there's right. usually a lot of shell shock at the other end of the phone when they go oh my lord that is so much money i was not expecting this was going to be years of our life yeah. um most people are just like, uh, thanks anyways. Uh, <laughs> have a nice day. Well, and when I tell them and I start breaking it down, you know, the skill drills, and when I'm actually going to be working with that dog and show them how much they pay me versus how much I'm working, I'm like, dude, you're literally paying me less than minimum wage. And they, and they see that. But it takes that whole, because I'm, I'm the dog is here with me, and for a long period of time, as long as it takes, and um, and you know, then they kind of get it. But it doesn't change the fact that it is a lot of money, and um, you know, a lot of people don't like that. I mean, but it's it's it takes work, and it takes sometimes it takes sacrifice. And I think that that money aspect uh, represents that sacrifice for some people. Yeah, they, it all comes down to it all comes down to expectations, right? If you blow the engine in your BMW, the expectation is not I'm going to get this fixed for two hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars, and it's going to be in the shop for an hour and a half, right? Like you know that that's a big thing that's going to take time, and it's going to cost a lot of money, like you know that when you blow your transmission in your car, it's not going to be cheap. They're going to have to order parts in and you're going to have to get a rental. Like those are the expectations, but because there's so few trainers that are talking about this, what we're talking about right now, a lot of people unfortunately don't have the expectation to understand that it is so much more intricate than even working with a dog who's human aggressive alone. Like, right. you know, it's just, it just the expectations are not really there, unfortunately. And, you know, I wish that there was better ways of being able to communicate these expectations with people earlier so that they could be more proactive. And like, I think that if people understood how much it was going to cost and how much it would change their life, people would honestly buy different dogs or or adopt different dogs and do you know get significant training so much sooner like yeah. like it's so rare that somebody comes to me and says you know what we're thinking about having a baby in one two three years whatever the case is and like he's never really been around kids and we want to be proactive like i might see a client like that once a year right and and, and i get it you know people don't really think about the long term they think about right now but um but yeah again it comes down to a, a, a an expectation thing and um sometimes there's a little bit of shell shock and understanding that things are pretty things are going to be pretty intense it's it, it it's a it's a big deal right yeah well and i mean that's what i love it when people do their homework and one of the favorite things that i like to do as professionals is to match make and to find a dog for the family. And I tell them exactly why I like this dog for your family. Mm. And uh, there's, I mean, there's hundreds of different breeds out there, you know, I look at Morris dogs, just a, it's kind of basically a dictionary. It's not one of the foo-foo dictionaries that are trying to sell you on these breeds. It just basically tells you what their job was. Right. And, you know, Jennifer Hack and I spoke about, um, 
you know, how some of these descriptions of these dog breeds could be further from the truth based on what I've worked with. And, you yeah. know, like I can tell you that the Malinois is a perfect dog for millennials and um, <laughs> it's a sporty dog, you know, <laughs> and it just kills me. But, and then uh, oh. there's these other things like the, this one's an old one, the right dog for you, uh, Dr. Totora, Daniel Totora. Uh, oh, there you go. And basically, they they have different uh, check checklists that you can go down, and 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 they also have different um, graphs for each of these dogs. You know, telling you if they are, you know, their indoor activity, outdoor activity, vigor, uh, behavioral consistency, dominance to strange dogs, dominant dominance to familiar people, territorial. You know, and that's where. We need to remember that this is a decade decision, and I like it when people do their homework and, and get into some of these really cool breeds. Um, and then when you go meet them and see that that they're solid dogs, that they're trustworthy, and, and uh, as a professional, you're not going to see that family ever again because they're going to have a, a wonderful life with that dog, but that's what I prefer. Sure. Sure. You know, where I see people that get the dogs that don't do the homework and it's a management issue. And even though we train the dog, chances are I'm going to be seeing this family once a year at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's a challenge, right? Like, like, there's all of these different breeds out there that are becoming popular and, in my opinion, should not be popular. Like, no offense, but why should a family – who lives in a townhouse own a great Pyrenees. I don't understand that. There's no use for that. Right? Like I'm training so many of these livestock guardian dogs and I'm going, you don't have livestock. Like you have to wonder why you're coming into a dog trainer saying he's guarding my house and he's trying to bite people that come into my house. I didn't want that. Well, that's part of who the dog is. Yeah. And so, you know, you can pay me to help you and, and to do the training. Don't get me wrong. But it comes down to this very simple understanding of doing the research, not looking at how beautiful the dog looks or or something like that. Or you right. meet somebody when you were in junior high school that had, a, you know, one of these breeds you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago and making an expectation based on that. The fact of the matter is, is that there are some dogs that make fabulous um, house dogs and family dogs and some that are horrible as family dogs, They're just terrible. Right. And unfortunately, the vast majority of uh, of dogs that I see that are not good with kids, it's like, yeah, like that's kind of a common sense thing, right? Like, but it, it's it's hard for me to, people to make these things because you read on the internet the Pyrenees, the Marema, these you know the Anatolian Shepherd, they're they're loyal dogs. Yeah, they're loyal if they have a job, but they're not loyal if they don't have a job. Right. Every single one of those livestock guardian breed dogs, I have, I don't know if I'd say every single, but at least 80% of them end up biting people in the family. Right. And so we need to do better research and people need to be open to say, listen, I work with these dogs. Here's what you actually need. And, you know, I, I've gone on this, I've gone on this crusade over the last years telling people you need to find yourself the fattest, stupidest, black black labrador retriever you can find and that is the perfect family dog there is no replacement for it there never ever will be a better replacement for it golden doodle is not the answer you need a fat labrador retriever english story. lab english lab that's what i recommend you know the big squat labradors and i've gotten many of those from my clients and guess what they love them man and they're, they're awesome dogs. They're so dogs. awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, yeah, I try. In fact, I'm looking for one right now. I have a breeder up here in Bellingham, just north of me. 
who uh, is very popular. And so uh, uh, when when I find a really good breeder, I, I, I really hold on to them, you know, because they know what they're doing. They're producing an amazing dog. And um, it seems that a lot of times in the rescues, and we, we go often to the shelters here, that a lot of these dogs are very high energy, very high drive. And, and um, you know, they're, they're cute dogs, and I get it. Um, but it's this dog, we need to look more at just what this dog looks at like sure. and take into to consideration what this dog's job was, like you were saying. And if we give this dog a, an unemployment situation, a lot of times, uh, gremlins will pop up in the, in the behavior that isn't really conducive with the everyday human life. Right. Here's, here's a good quote. Uh, for educating clients, if you do not give your dog a job, they will become entrepreneurs and they will start a business that becomes a pain in your butt. Yeah. <laughs> They'll set up shop right in your right on your butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, we had a Desiree McLean uh, said earlier, uh, oh, talking about the kids and the dogs that. Uh, he was always super interested in kids and dog safety, felt it gave pretty good advice before, but it's true that being an actual parent gives you a totally new perspective. No offense meant to non-parents. Sure. None taken. You know, it's it's something that when you have a different perspective on a situation, it's it's it changes everything. Uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer uh, says that, uh, you know, when, when you change the thing, that you look at the things you look at change right and so uh, perspective is everything and uh and that's the other thing too is like i try not to judge anybody that even i mean if it's a situation that i know is a very very rough situation i'm not gonna i'm not gonna cut any corners i'm going to let them know exactly how i feel and I've only had a couple of these where I'm like, look, this dog needs to get out of this house today. And, um, you know, I'm not, I, I, I can't really force that, uh, them to do anything, but I mean, I just, it's so hard when you know, when you see something in the dog that is like a ticking time bomb, as a professional, I mean, there's just a, a, such a sense of urgency that comes uh, comes up that uh, you want to convey that in a way that is a, in a professional manner, yeah. but you also want to, uh, you know, exude um, some urgency, right? I think there are times and places where you have to help save people from themselves, right? Yeah, I mean, they can't make that decision. They can't give up on the dog. They can't rehome the dog. They can't do what needs to be done. One of the things I oftentimes tell people is, listen, if you're not able to do this, you have to realize that you are going to deal with short-term discomfort for long-term freedom, right? You're like you're always going to miss this dog. You're always going to wish he could have been part of your home and whatever. If you do have to rehome this dog or, or put the dog down, which is very tragic. And I hope nobody ever has to do that, but there, trust me when I say, if this dog bites your kid in the face and has scars on their face for the rest of their life, the amount of pain that your kid will feel and you will feel knowing that you put your dog and sorry, your kid into that situation, that is far more pain than you and, and that you and your kid will have to deal with long term. So you can make the decision now or you can potentially leave it and have to make that decision later on. But I'd much rather have you do it now. And, and if you'd like, I can tell you a story about this that I oftentimes tell um and it it is one of the most shocking stories um, about somebody with a kid and a dog, and um, it really it really brings to to mind how important it is to take our kids' safety in, into to be the most um, it, it has to be the biggest priority in the world.
I'm uh, chatting right now with Casey Cover, and hopefully she might be able to come on board here if she's available. All righty. Um, uh, let me maybe tell you tell the story in case anybody um, is in this type of a position who's watching or who will watch later. So I had this man call me, and he seemed very very nice. He told me how he wanted to come in to meet with me because he had a, um, a canny Corso and um, he was unsure whether his dog had bit his son the night before. So I asked, why do you think, like, why are you unsure about that? And he said, well, the dog always sleeps in the kid's room. The kid was, I think, about nine years old. And um, the kid got out of bed to go give the dog a hug uh, and the dog was sleeping on the floor. And then the kid came out of his bedroom crying and there's blood all over his face. And so I said, okay, so what do you mean? The dog bit your kid. What, like, why is this a question? He said, well, we're not sure. You know, we're kind of thinking that maybe he was startled and he just moves quickly and, you know, his teeth kind of punctured him. And I, I said, like, you realize how, like, ridiculous that sounds, right? Like, no offense, but that's that's just, come on, think about this for a second. So he continued to kind of make excuses for his dog. And I said, listen, here's what I'll do. Bring the dog in. I'll make time for you as soon as I possibly can. Give me 48 hours. I'll book a time for you right now. Bring the dog in. But promise me you will not allow this dog anywhere near your kids because he has two kids anywhere near your kids until you meet with me and we can look at steps moving forward. Maybe I can get a sense. Maybe I look at the wound and get a sense for whether the dog did bite, whatever. I, I want to try to help you out here. He said, absolutely. I would love that. He promised that he would not let his dog anywhere near his kids. He called me back 24 hours later. He's crying. He's telling me that we have to cancel our session. I said, what happened? I just put my dog down. I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. What happened, right? Like, I thought you were going to keep the dog and the kids separated. Sure enough, he let the dogs and the kids do their thing. The kid dropped a piece of popcorn on the, on the, on the sofa and was eating, this, it was eating popcorn. The dog went for it at the same time as the kid. The dog... The 24 hours after being bitten by the same dog bit him in the face again. And I told the man, listen, I don't even want to know what it's like to be in your position right now. I don't have to beat you up any more than I'm sure that you're beating yourself up. There's nothing that can take this back. Your dog will have sc your kid will have scars on his face for the rest of his life. Um, but I want to tell people this story because what you're going through right now can can save people from making this decision in the future. And, you know, he, he said, you know, it was the stupidest thing I've ever done, not listening to, you know, that advice. I made excuses for him. I should have kept him separated. I should have made my kid a, a priority. And now I can't take that back. And I And when people call me with the same issue, I tell them, listen, if your dog has bit your kid once, okay but you do not let your dog bite your kid twice. <coughs> yep. Period. Don't do that because you will be able to live with yourself. If your dog bites your kid once and you get training or you rehome the dog or something like that, you will not be able to live with yourself if it happens twice. Right. Because right. if it happens twice, typically the dog ends up getting euthanized. Plus we've got all the issues that we got to deal with the kid and all the fear and all that kind of stuff. And yep. so sometimes you got to ch choose uh, short-term discomfort over long-term comfort and safety for your family. And, and that's not me saying you got to give up on all these dogs. I'm just saying worst case scenario. Um, sometimes you, you have to make some tough judgment calls. Yeah. And we got to look at that breed of dog. I mean, that dog is a powerful ass breed. I mean, it's an Italian Mastiff. That is no joke. You know, the same thing with Akitas or, you know, any of these other dog breeds that are, um, you know, larger, too, they're strong, man. And as a professional, they're not really likely candidates of being brought on a, 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 
um, for a rehab case. I mean, it's something that uh, people don't take into consideration. I mean, these they're they're cute as puppies, <laughs> but they just grow really big, man. And and I I tell people too. Even if it's just a, a poodle or a cocker spaniel or something, I, I want the kids to know when not to mess with that dog. And so I tell the parents, you know, the three three instances that that kid is most likely to get bit is number one is when the dog is eating food. And so when you said that there's popcorn on that couch, I, I, I kind of cringed a little bit because I knew that that would definitely be a point of contention with that animal. I call uh, food, any type of food, dog money. <laughs> because dogs treat it kind of like we treat money. And, uh, yeah, we had this conversation <laughs> about if we left a, a case full of money out on the street corner in, uh, you know, downtown Seattle – we'd have a um, possibly a riot after people started noticing and this money started blowing all over the place. And, um, excuse me, the most uh, reserved calm people could be losing their mind. And sometimes this happens with a high value treat that a dog has taken possession of, or really, really wants like some popcorn or something like that. So, uh, a, a child is more likely to get bit, number one, when a dog is eating, when the when a dog is uh, mouthing an object like a toy or a bone, and they're showing the possessiveness over that, yeah. and the child wants to go up yeah. and, and take it from him. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a tickle in my throat. Uh, so mouthing an object. Um, and then number three is when a dog is sleeping. Yeah. And uh, there was an yeah. old saying when I was a kid, there was a saying, let sleeping dogs lie. And I want to bring that saying back. And so <laughs> when we see a, a sleeping dog over there, you let sleeping dogs lie. You let them be. You you don't mess with them whatsoever. And if I were to go over and mess with this dog <laughs> as a kid and the dog were to come after me, that wouldn't be the only trouble I would be getting into with that dog. <laughs> You know, my grandpa or somebody would be like, what are you thinking messing with that dog when they're sleeping? And uh, we need to bring that back, that, that you know, uh, giving the kids the, the knowledge themselves so they know when not to mess with this animal. Because that animal will recognize that adolescent energy in that kid and turn around and have no qualms with uh, giving them a, a quick bite to, to interrupt their behavior. This kind of bring, brings this up another kind of point. Brings up another point. I like that point that, that, you, made that you made there. Point that you made there. Um, um, oftentimes, trainers don't talk to kids. One of the things I absolutely need to evaluate is what are the kids like? Right? Yes. Are the kids under control? Do they have control? Do they have learning disabilities? disabilities? All of these factors have to be the decision to go forward to go forward your friend off. Because if you have a kid who struggles with ADHD and OCD and these things, and parents that refuse to draw the line and draw the line, so if you do this, this is the consequence for you, my son or my daughter. It's not going to work, it's right? Work, because you can right. train the dog all you want. Train the dog all you want. But it's running and jumping and the dog when it's sleeping. When it's sleeping. Like, come but, on. Like, that's not oh, fair to the dog, you fair. know? And so I always look at that. I always look at that. When I'm, when when I'm looking at taking a potential line of dominance. What is the what is good life? life? I, I'll never forget the time when this one dog come in to a family. And then it seemed like very nice people. And this kid was missing four years old. And he was just like, he was just like a dog in the dog. And the parents weren't really parents weren't really just kind of slapping the dog and stuff. And they were coming in for the issue because the dog had bit the dog and whatever. And I said, Can you like like forcibly restrain this child right now? Because he's gonna get bitten right here. Like he's hitting that dog. Why are you not, are you not stopping him from doing that? Yeah. 
right? Like if he right. like if he was a child at a playground, child, a playground let him do that. Let him do that. He's hitting the dog in the head. The dog in the head. And I'll never forget the time I said, like, listen, like, listen, like, this is so important. You understand that you're kidding. And you're very large component. And uh, anyways, for some reason, they were willing to draw a line in the sand and give their kids some discipline and and whatever. And, And they were trying to blame everything on the dog. And, like, you know, I'm sure the dog had issues, too, but it's like. The kid is hitting the dog in the head in the evaluation. It can't get much worse than that. Yeah, well, a lot of times. Oh, James uh, Maturana set from uh, down in uh, Australia says, what's up? So um, a lot of times you'll see that uh, I'll come into a training situation and those kids are off the wall. <laughs> right. You know, and and uh, you see a lot of it correlates with the structure with the kids and the structure with the the dog. It's just that I'm there to to help out the dog. But sometimes I'm an advocate. I mean, I'm always an advocate for that dog. I tell people that I'm kind of like an attorney for their animal that they just hired. <laughs> I represent the dog. You know, I want I want what's best for this animal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I will definitely stand up and be like, no, 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 that is unacceptable, unacceptable. We do not hit dogs um and i try to reach the kid but it's hard when you're dealing with a learning um uh, or behavioral disability uh, that you don't know about and uh you and as professionals we're just we're just there trying to cram as as much uh we're, we're one trying to recognize the pattern that we see in front of us with these changing variables of the human the dog and the environment that's always changing up and then we're trying to make suggestions on how they can write this situation, um, usually within a couple hours of meeting them and and, uh, and also, um, you know, uh, talking with them on the phone or whatever we do to evaluate that case um, and, and, and trying to make real dramatic changes sometimes uh, pretty quickly um, is, is, you know, hard to do, especially when you see a big influence of behavior is that child or the lack of structure on a completely different aspect of their life. And, and a lot of times people want me to fix just this little part of the dog and I have to let them know, look, that's just a symptom yeah, yeah. of the overall that, you know, that's what's popping up here. We need to get to the root of the problem here, which is structure routine. You know, this dog is acting out right now because he's it's it's kind of like a cry for help it's like dude i don't know what to do and i also tell people you know dogs dogs they bite people for two reasons one because they think they can and two because they think they have to right and so it's something that um you know when playing with the dog too, that's another thing that we work, we, we look at and work on as well with the kids and how they play and, um, you know, that, that type of stuff. But yeah, you know, take into, into account every single factor that makes up that family unit is uh, very, very important. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, one of the things I want to chat about, about, about is two misconceptions that, that oftentimes that come about when it comes to kids and dogs. Um, so having worked with many dogs and many people in this situation, one of the things that oftentimes somebody tells me, uh, my wife is pregnant and we're going to have a, this new baby come in, let's say six months. And we're really concerned that the dog is going to be aggressive with the baby. One of the things that I've found over the years is that is so incredibly rare and I firmly believe that the reason why that is rare, and there are, are caveats which I'll go through, but I firmly believe that the reason that that's so rare is because the dog has nine months to be able to bond with the baby when the baby is actually getting, you know, is, is actually going through the pregnancy, right? And right. so I've literally had women call me before and say like, oh, I don't know what is wrong with my dog. He's just getting super defensive of me and guarding me and whatever. And I've literally been on the phone with women before and I'd say, well, you're pregnant, right? And they say, I'm not pregnant. What are you talking about? I'm not even in a relationship. And I'll say, 
go get a test. Call me back tomorrow. And they go, you're crazy. You're nuts. So they hang up the phone. And then sure enough, they call me back. And How did you know? I'm like, come on. One plus one equals two here. Come on, guys. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on the fact that you have a baby. Great news. Um, but, you know, dogs have the ability to be able to know these things before human beings do, before even some of the medical tests uh, can can f- figure these things out because of the hormonal changes that are happening in, in, in women, et cetera. And so your dog has the ability to spend nine months with that baby. So it's very rare that even if your dog is not great with kids, if you get pregnant and you're going to be, the dog is going to live with you for nine months, it's really unlikely that your dog is going to start being aggressive towards your child. There is a few caveats. If the dog has already had aggression towards people in the family. So let's say husband and wife or you know, man and woman in the home uh, and there's a baby coming, then usually it will transition over and that's to uh, something you want to be very cautious about. Um, or if the dog has a history of badly guarding things like bones, toys, food, and that kind of stuff. But traditionally um, when people call me and they say, you know what, he's not great around kids, tell people listen it's highly unlikely uh, hold on dude your your audio went out <clears throat> one you thing guys, whoever's listening the other thing is, um, yeah. can you guys hear his audio is it bad i had to mute him he hasn't, he hasn't stopped talking dog started dog acting aggressively acting towards other dogs when we go for a walk. I'm really concerned that my dog is going to bite my dog or whatever. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You just don't see dogs that develop aggression or reactivity aggression or reactivity. Um, towards other dogs, they just randomly start biting kids, especially members of that family. Members of that family. Oh, sorry, my audio is bad. Yeah, sorry, my audio is bad. I don't hear, but. Um, but anyway, those are the two misconceptions that oftentimes I hear. Um, if your dog has nine months to be able to connect with your baby, he or she's probably going to be fine with your kid. And just because your dog has dog aggression issues, it doesn't mean your dog is going to start becoming aggressive to your child. These are two things I hear pretty often, and they almost never happen. They almost never happen. Well, cool. Yeah, a lot of people have misconception about what will happen. I know that they're trying to uh, err on the side of caution. But, yeah, the dogs have a totally different uh, perception of what what's going on in that, that woman's body, you know? So, did uh, you see anything with your dog uh, when your wife was pregnant? Yeah, one of my female dogs, yeah, one of my, actually female my youngest, actually my youngest uh, started getting really, started really getting really um, um, not needy, but just very clean. But she very around, around a lot more. She was a lot more clear. She was never defensive or guarding or anything. But you could tell she really wanted to be close to the baby. Um, and my older dogs. Um, and my older dogs. Which I find kind of interesting. Um, I figured my older dogs would be a little bit more kind of mothering and fathering, but not as much fathering. But other than that, I didn't really see it. Granted, my dogs are very, my dogs are very, very well socialized. That kind of stuff. I wouldn't expect a whole lot, but that was the only thing that we saw. Awesome, man. Well, it looks like we are nearing an hour here so we're going to sign off i'm going to uh i gotta run and i gotta run a bunch of dogs myself here at the property <laughs> but if people want to get a hold of you what's the best way for them to do that ted uh you can go to my website uh, go to my uh website. best website to get me usually is mangodogs.com um and uh, an email if you're interested. I have a free video course on Udemy about how to introduce your dogs. Thanks for posting that, Bill. How to introduce your dogs to your children. So feel free to shoot me an email and I'll send you a link over that. It's completely free. Made it just to try to help people out as much as I can. And, uh, 
And you know, like I said, get get a hold of me, and I'd love to I'd love to help you. Or if you have any friends that have any help, we can have bring on a new child home or something like that. I'd love to send that over to you. I'd love to send that over to you. Awesome. That's on Udemy, U D E M Y, and he'll send him a link to that. Yeah. And uh, all, as always, yeah. man, I, I look forward to uh, you know doing this again in the future. And uh, always, always love talking with you, brother. Thank you for having me on. Really Thanks appreciate for it. Thanks for having me on. Really and everybody. And everybody. All right, everybody. Take care. We'll talk soon. And hold on. <laughs>